Now, Sports Talk with Broads. Here's Hunter Brody. Hey everyone, before we get started, make sure you smash that thumbs up button. And if you're new to the channel, hit the subscribe button. I greatly appreciate all the new people that come and hang out after every Philadelphia sporting event to discuss what happened in the action. Lastly, every Wednesday on my Twitter, at Broads81, there is a pinned tweet at the top of my profile. I do a hump day giveaway. You can win something for free. This week, it's an Eagles jersey, Devontae Smith. You will not want to miss it. Although I'm uploading this Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, so there will be a new giveaway very soon. But make sure you enter to win. It's so simple. The rules are at the top of my Twitter page at Broads81. All right? All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Make sure you enjoy the pod. Oh, it's never comfortable. <laughs> oh, it's never comfortable with this Phillies team. But they do win 6-2. to two, And it's a big win because, well, you have Chase Anderson on the mound. So anytime you can squeeze a victory with either Vince Velasquez, Matt Moore, or Chase Anderson on the bump, kudos to you. So that's huge in that way. And also, you're on the road. You're going up against a division opponent. And you win game one. You have to win series when you you're away from Citizens Bank Park. So at least this is a step in the right direction. You're putting your foot forward to accomplish that goal, and it needs to be better. Your record right now away from home is garbage, and you're going to have to win such an insane... Like, if that kept up, if you were going to keep up with that pace of 5-12 and 12 on, the, on the road... Think about what your winning percentage needs to be at home for that to be reasonable if you are going to get your goal done, which is play a damn playoff game for once in the last 7,532 years. So please, please, can we get smoother in a different ballpark? And this is at least a step in the right direction. It got ugly. It got scary. I got nervous. It wasn't the cleanest game ever. Still some Joe Girardi, Joe Girardi decisions that could be questioned that we are going to debate, but you grab a win in the victory column. And knowing how game two of that Brave series went, knowing how Sunday night baseball went where you just got demolished and you weren't even close whatsoever, hey, put it behind you. You get a new series, wash it. It was terrible. It made my eyes bleed. I was upset. I was, realistically, I was depressed. Put it behind you. Face the Nationals, take care of business. So, once again, this team climbs out to an early lead. That's what they do. That's all they know. And it's amazing that they do that. I just wish they can keep that going for longer stretches and they don't just fall apart completely. They got enough. They got enough. But I hate how it goes so silent for so many stretches afterwards. Here's what I know. Bryce Harper gave you a lead 433 feet. This ball was demolished for a one to nothing lead. And I'm sure for him individually to make sure you crush a ball in that ballpark, it's got to feel good. It's got to feel great. I'd be scared to fight, face Bryce Harper every single time he's there because you know he's just wired differently and he's just prepared to go off. I'm sure he's got a little bit more fire lit under his ass when he's in that ballpark. So he sets the tone nice and early. Then you play some small ball. I was a little stunned to see small ball. They don't ask how. They ask how many, and the answer is three. Three runs in the first four innings. So in the third inning, Harper walks, Brad Miller, Reese Hoskins. Bang, 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 moving around the bases the old-fashioned way. How about in the fourth? Odubel Herrera, who had a great day on the base paths. He had two hits. He was on base four times. Odubel Herrera was awesome. And you can chalk up the late inning, eighth inning addition to the insurance that you had, which came up big because Hector Neris was dicing around the plate. He thought he had the strikeout to end the game. He didn't have the strikeout. Maybe he was drawing back and forth with the Nats dugout because he did a mini celebration thinking the blue would ring him up to end the game. Odubel Herrera started to get on. The right track of the Oduba Herrera that we need to see. Someone is finally taking advantage of all of the miserable play in center field. 
He's been a huge jump in this lineup. That's for damn sure. But anyway, going back to that fourth inning where they scored some runs, Odubel Herrera Anderson doing his job, which isn't always easy from your pitching role at the plate to do his job, and Andrew McCutcheon knocks him in. So you had the power followed up by the small ball, and you're up to a 3 nothing lead. Now, you knew that it was going to go downhill at some point. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, and not only just when, but how. Because it could be the weirdest ways, it could be the most gut-wrenching ways, it could be the most basic ways. You pick and choose. On any given night, it's one of those. But somehow, when and if was absolutely in play when it comes to this team. What kills me is that sixth inning. Specifically, the Phillies half. Bases loaded, no outs. Chase Anderson on his way up to the plate. Now, he was pitching fine to this point. His his stat line finished, and some of this is with what happens after the sixth inning, but his stat line finished of five innings, three hits, two earned runs, one walk, five strikeouts, 85 pitches. He actually had a disgusting, filthy changeup just coming at the... the trajectory of this pitch and the movement on this pitch coming inside to a right-handed hitter swinging through it no business making contact at all swung right through it I mean it was felt he had some nice change-up action he also though early on first inning could have got demolished cutter that didn't cut left middle in Schwarber could have did some damage to it So for as great as maybe his five strikeouts were and his five innings were, I thought first inning he could have got crucified but escaped because the Nationals, well, whether they weren't locked in at that moment yet or the Nationals are who they are, he escaped. Now, pitchers escape all the time. He's not the only pitcher to throw a pitch that should have got murdered that he left hanging or left in the middle of the plate. He's not the only one where a batter either foul tips it or swings through it or doesn't swing at all. That happens all the time, so, you know, it it does happen. But Chase Anderson was fine to that point. Zero outs, trying to force him into the sixth inning. I just thought Joe should have recognized with Alec Boehm not in the lineup and Brad Miller playing, who Brad Miller made some really stellar defensive plays, charging the ball, confidently throwing on the run off a big hop. I was pretty impressed with what Brad Miller did defensively at third base, but knowing you could bring up Alec Boehm, and I'm not telling you that Alec Boehm is some sensational player right now because Coming into the game, he was hitting low 200s for a reason. He came up huge in the eighth, so he can come up big at any point of any game. That is Alec Boehm. He hasn't been hot to this point. He's been putting good, bad on ball, and he's been squaring up the ball. You got bases loaded, though. You got to put your guy in a prime position to succeed. Why are we forcing a pitcher up to the dish and Chase Anderson? It's not your star. It's not your number one guy. It's your fifth starter. He gave you your five. Let's move on. Now you're forcing it. He doesn't record outs in the sixth inning. So was Joe's philosophy? Here's a chance to do that. Here, we finally have Chase Anderson throwing the ball well. So maybe we can build his confidence by having him record it out in the sixth. But I look at it as tack on some runs. Now, here's the opposite side to it. Andrew McCutcheon struck out looking on a pitch that you got to be able to execute, dude. Top of your lineup is up. So let's say Chase Anderson gets out like he did. He flied out to left field. Okay, you have your top of the lineup up, bases loaded one out. Andrew McCutcheon cannot strike out looking. Gene Segura, he put together a 14-pitch at-bat where he started out looking at two pitches right down the middle to fall back 0-2. I give him praise for battling for 14 pitches, and there were so many at-bats that went 11 deep. Schwarber had one. Didi had an aggressive one as well. Trey Turner had an awesome battle with the pitcher as well. You had multiple long, lengthy at-bats, which to me I love. That's the duel of who's going to make that mistake. Who's going to win that battle? I mean, it is a dogfight mentally. Are you going to guess the right pitch? Are you going to chase the wrong pitch? Who's going to win? Gene Segura, he squared up the ball nicely to center field, but it was right to the center fielder. Your top of the lineup came up with bases loaded, two outs, you score zero runs in the bottom half of the six. You try Chase Anderson back out there, and Trey Turner makes you pay because he hits a home run. Kyle Schwarber ends up getting an RBI, and it's 3-2. to two. So your offense did not get it done. 
I'm not putting all the blame. I am not. I am not putting all the blame on Joe because I blame players more than I blame the manager. Here's what I know. Your top of the lineup needs to knock in runs there. So it's it doesn't come down to one at bat. It doesn't. It does not come down to one at bat. There's so much that happens in a game. Chase Anderson, how about you pitch better to Trey Turner? You could do better than that. I know you can. I know that you have more in you in that sixth inning than you provided. You got to be stronger. You got to make better pitches. Come on. I, I know that you could have thrown better to Schwarber. I know you could have thrown better to Trey Turner. That's on you as well. Your manager gave you the benefit of the doubt. Your manager rocked with you. Pay him back. That goes on the player. Pay him back. I saw you do it for five. What happened? What changed? Make the proper adjustment. Make the proper throws. Deliver your pitches better. Come on. So now it's a 3-2 ball game after the sixth. Here's what I liked. In the seventh, though, the Phillies did bounce back with having a grade A chance to produce more runs. JT Real Muto walks. Miller walks. So once again... Reese Hoskins, Didi Gregorius. Guys that you should be able to rely on in that batter's box to come up with a timely hit, to produce when you need to, to square a baseball up through the zone and put together a beautiful swing. Well, they both get out, and you had first and second with one out in that inning. <laughs> oh, come on. Runners in scoring positions. Men left stranded. You're only going to get so many before, guess what? Here comes the punch from the other team. How about this in the seventh? Bottom half for the seventh, right? You don't execute. Does the other team? Well, no, but they got extremely close. Pinch hit double for Zimmerman in the se- in the seventh inning with two outs. Why does it feel? I don't know the actual numbers. I'm just spitballing off of my head here on what it feels like in my gut. That pinch hitter's against the Phillies are batting at least over 800. I swear to God, anytime a pinch hitter, whether it's the Atlanta Braves, Pablo Sandoval, you name it, if someone pinch hits, Darren Ruff with the San Francisco Giants when they came to town hitting moonshots, whoever the Phillies face, a pinch hitter is going to rake and step up to the plate and and knock a good at-bat together. It bothers me that that's the case. But here's a pinch hit double with two outs for Ryan Zimmerman. And it, it ends up getting a, a insane at-bat with Alvarado. Kinsler was at the time in the beginning. Then you got to go to Alvarado. He goes toe-to-toe with Trey Turner. Eventually, though, there's a pitch that goes 9,000 feet above the strike zone. It, it was the worst pitch I've ever seen in my life. You talk about, and it's funny, I saw it was either Jason Stark or Ken Rosenthal of The Athletic, and they were talking about how nowadays, when you look at how these pitchers are throwing, yeah, they're throwing with velocity, but you talk about location and precise and poise and being where they need to be in the strike zone, good luck. You are just not getting command. It's all about the heat. It's all about the intensity. And I can see why there's value in both. Don't get me wrong. I mean, yeah, I might sound silly. Like, what do you mean? You don't value command? No, of course I value command. But to say the only thing that matters is command is no, you got to find the the mix. You got to find the guy that can give you 97, 98, 99, but can still work around the strike zone. Alvarado's all over the map and he's useful. Don't get me wrong. He's useful with this. He can get your big outs. He can get out of big moments. Hell, people wanted him to be the closer the other day because Hector Neris fell flat on his face. This is what I tried telling you. Alvarado's a mess. Coonrod's a mess. Coonrod came also into this game. And with the bullpen in general, they closed the door. It just wasn't the smoothest way to do it. It got choppy. It got a little murky. It got a little muddy. Close the door, though, and all you got to ask for is for them to close the door. These guys are going to be up and down, up and down, and just know that they're going to be toying with your emotions every single outing. Alvarado, though, ends up walking Soto in four after the pinch hit with Kinsler on the mound with the pinch hit double. The Alvarado at bat with Turner, and then the walk to Soto. You have bases loaded for Bell, but fortunately for the Phillies, Bell ended up striking out, and he got out of that jam in the seventh. In the eighth, Oduba Herrera starts you off by getting on base. He's on second. Alec Bohm pinch hit. 
Rocks one into right center field-ish. You end up knocking in Odubel Herrera. You're up 4-2, to two, get some insurance. And from there, Andrew Knapp, with bases loaded, provides two RBI. And the reason why he was that bad is because in the seventh, there was a foul tip that ended up fouling off of, I believe it was Bell at that at-bat. It fouled off of JT Real Muto, and we thought it was like the kneecap, and it hit the padding, which was crazy to see how much pain JT Real Muto was in because if you see the slow-mo, it does hit the, the padding of the catcher equipment. So I was a little stunned. So I did get some statements from the beat reporters and Joe Girardi for after the game. I want to uh, blow it up here so I can read because my one monitor is a little farther away. Okay, can we – how about we – oh, jeez, way too big. Okay, so – this is courtesy of Jim Salisbury of NBC Sports Philadelphia. Real Mucho was not hit on the kneecap, which is a good thing. Ball hit muscle. Girardi does not believe he will have to go on the injured list, but Real Mucho will be sore for a day or two. So I'm, I'm assuming we are going to see Andrew Knapp. And then this is also a little bit after the game as well. JT Romuto has a muscle contusion, a bruise essentially. Joe Girardi doesn't think it will be an, LL, an IL stint, but does not think Real Muto, but does think Real Muto will be sore tomorrow. So essentially, JT's probably going to miss some time with some sort of soreness, some sort of bruising, and Andrew Knapp will have to step in. I got to give credit to Andrew Knapp for what he has done to this point, you know? There was a time, and here's the stats for what he did previously under the other regime here with Matt Klentak and Gabe Kapler at the helm. In 2018, Andrew Knapp batted 198. That's absolutely pathetic and absolutely horrendous. In 187 at-bats. So for a role player, backup catcher, you know, that's garbage. He followed that up in 2019 with 136 at-bats, a little less, and he batted 213. Still not good production. Last year he had 278. Now less bats, 72 at-bats because of the shortened season. But even though the numbers right now won't show it at 152, that's what he's batting at the moment, he only has 33 at-bats. Uh, Andrew Knapp has had some timely hitting here, and he still has that energy that he provided for this team last year. And now there's this whole debate of him calling a better game than JT Real Muto, and this is why that's so flawed. JT, I'm not happy with what he called with Hector Neris in the Brave series, one two count fastball. He also didn't pitch it where it needed to be pitched. When you think of... What happened, I didn't like the call to begin with. But who's to say if Hector Neris actually pitched to the location of where JT called it, it wouldn't have been a better result. And after the game, Hector even stated, uh, that was the pitch I wanted to go to. So Hector saying that's the pitch, you know, maybe there was an element of Hector going there because Hector was JT calling the game as Hector wants it to be called. At the end of the day, the pitcher has say. If there's a number put down and he doesn't want to do it, he shakes him off and he goes with the trajectory of where he wants to go with that at-bat, with the pitch selection. So I still throw it on Hector more than JT. But this whole ERA and Eflin's ERA and all this, it, come on. When you catch to Chase Anderson, to Matt Moore, to Vince Velasquez, to other guys other than just Eflin, and it's not only Eflin that Andrew Knapp catches to, but there's so much context other than this is the ERA. It's not that simple. If you want it to be that simple, fine. You can have it that way. It's not that simple, though. JT catches to worse pitchers. JT catches to different guys. and I mean, it is what it is. The pitchers have the say. The pitchers have the say at the end of the day. And the pitchers have to execute. The pitch wasn't even where it needed to be. The pitch was missed. And when you missed, and that's why I met you with Chase Anderson, you missed. You missed uh, You missed a pitch early on that Schwarber could have drove big time and did it and missed. You got lucky. Sometimes you get lucky, and sometimes teams make you pay. But that goes on the pitcher more than it does the, the call the pitch selection. If it's drilled where JT wants it, well, then it's a different story. Then we can resurface. And that happens at times, but it happens to a lot of players as well. Uh, it's just, you know, I don't know. It's just crazy to me that we're even having that conversation. But I thought we would be, you know, a little bit more reasonable and understanding of how this works and how, you know, JT catches for more people and, there's just so much context. So much context. Okay. Ninth inning. Well, eighth inning. 
Brogdon comes in, does his job. Ninth inning, Hector Neris comes in. Took a lot of pitches. Got a little iffy. Essentially did his job, though, and closed the door for the 6-2 to two victory. And, you know, we'll see what ends up happening when we have, who is it tomorrow on the mound? I think the last game is, I think the last game is Eflin versus, or, oh, man, what is it? I know tomorrow is Lester. I'm all, I'm all over the map. It's like I know all the pitchers and who's going. I just can't put it in to perspective fully on exactly what it is. Okay, so for Wednesday, May 12th. I can't believe it's May 12th already. Zach Wheeler versus John Lester. And then for Thursday's afternoon game, it's Zach Eflin versus Patrick Corbin. And remember how badly we wanted Patrick Corbin at the time? He is not having a good season at all. He's 1-3 with a 7-3-6 ERA. And I truly wanted to go out and snag Corbin at the time. It's just crazy to see how much he has somewhat blown up to this point and just has not been smooth whatsoever. We're going to take some anytime outline calls right now. Before we do, big names are headlining this weekend's UFC 262 card. There will be no shortage of action. And DraftKings Sportsbook, the official sports betting partner of UFC, has a heavyweight offer for this weekend's fight with 100 to 1 odds. One fighter will be walking away with the belt. Will you be walking away with the cash? Download the top rated DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code BROADS when you sign up to turn $1 into $100 when you bet on a main card fighter to win. Place your bet and watch the fist fly this weekend. That's code Broach to turn $1 into $100 on select main card fighters for a limited time only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 or older, Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Restrictions apply in partnership with Meadows Racetrack and Casino. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. All right. We have a couple calls. We have a couple texts. Let's take a few phone calls first. What's up, bro? Here the I mean, my God. Here the Philly. Beat the Nationals, 6-2. Hector Neris, man, he, he always gets dicey at the end. But Hector, Hector number 10, it came through instead of uh, blowing it. But I, I think it was a good game by the Phillies. I, I thought there were too many men, men on um, base sometimes. But Chris Anderson pitched a pretty good game, in my opinion. He allowed the home run to um, Turner. And then he he allowed a base runner to uh, somebody in, in the top of the six. But uh, I think it was a pretty good game by him. He got the win. And the bullpen was fine. Coonrod, uh, he got he got the run in, but Andrew now came up with the big base hit out of Bohm. Herrera got on base. Bryce Harper had a dinger. I'm a good game. Yeah, I, look, you, you kind of went through everything, and you're right. This team won a game with Chase Anderson. I thought Chase Anderson was the best we've seen in the five innings. Then I just wish he could have supported his manager there. The Manager put a lot of trust in you, took a bullet for you, allowed you to go up to bat. And there's been many moments this year where the team was struggling to score runs. And Joe Girardi would pinch hit for Chase Anderson very early just to try and throw somebody up to the dish. Whether it was Brad Miller, they were just trying to look for an offensive spark. I just think it's weird that in games past, they elected to do that when it wasn't bases loaded with zero outs. And it was more just really nothing there or just a minor opportunity opportunity here. This is massive. This is let's blow the game wide open. This is let's cruise to an easy victory. This is let's kick them in the teeth and you allow Chase Anderson to go up there and it's because of how well he was pitching. So we acknowledge that. We recognize that. You were very strong to that point. Now you have to respond by saying, Skip, I got you. You got my back. I got your back. And here's Trey Turner, just monster, monster home run. And it was a it was a gut punch right back. A lot of gut punches throughout this Philly season to this point. And I'm sure that was damaging to Joe Girardi. I'm sure he was thinking, you got to be kidding me. But there's so many more to that. You know, like, to only focus on that one decision to me is doing a disservice to the rest of the team. It's doing a disservice to Andrew McCutcheon looking at a pitch to strike out. It does a disservice to Gene Segura, who's been red hot this year. And I'm not going to rip. I really did have a, a seriously solid at-bat. He's fouling all pitches, whether it was just straight back or down the third baseline or down the first baseline. He was fouling. He was battling. But you take the first two pitches right down the middle of the plate where you probably could have drove one of them, and that's what you've done to this point all season long. You've been driving the baseball. I thought he left two pitches right. And if you take the first one, fine. To take the second one, it's like, dude, I mean, it was right there once again. Please be, you know, be a little bit more aggressive up there. It's like, 
that's letting them off the hook. And I'm not going to let them off the hook. I'm not going to have Joe Girardi's decision. And to be fair, look, Alec Bohm in the eighth was monstrous, right? You could have used him in the in the sixth inning. I don't know if he would have came up clutch in that moment. I don't know. I don't know. He saved him for the eighth. And in the eighth, though, he came into the game and he came up clutch then. So when he did select to use Alec Bohm, when Odubel Herrera was on second base, he ended up becoming an effective player for you. And when you had to rely on Andrew Knapp, that player stepped up. It's like, do you see that the player stepped up? And that's the way that I analyze it more so than the managerial decision, which plays a role. I'm not downplaying the impact of it. I just don't put as much stock as others in it. What's going on, bro? I, I cannot do this for 162. This bullpen, every single night, they're about to blow me. I'm so shocked Alvarado got out of that jam. He's using like a 13 pitch up out of Trey Turner and then he threw one 15 freaking feet. And after that, I couldn't find the strokes. And I thought we were going to get a classic Alvarado where he can't throw the, can't throw a single strike, but he was able to buckle down and get that out. And then Naris in the ninth inning, that wasn't pretty, but I guess we got the job done, but. Yeah, they're not all going to be pretty. I guess there was no more to that call. It actually just ended with but. I did not end that short. It it ended at but. Um, but, yeah, I mean, look, it <laughs> they're not all going to be pretty. And knowing how the last two games went, it's to stop the bleeding. I wanted Aaron Nola on Sunday Night Baseball to stop the bleeding. I had to wait for Chase Anderson through five innings to stop the bleeding. That was the guy who, who, uh, who got it done. So when you look at a Zach Wheeler and a Zach Eflin coming up, you have that chance. You have that moment for you to make a statement against the Washington Nationals. I think this team is trying to find its identity. You know, like you bring in a Schwarber. You bring in some of these guys this year. It's it's a tweaked Nationals team. So it's like I don't think that they have really figured out who they're going to be. yet. Not that every team has. It's somewhat a little into the season. We're a month into the season. At the same time, there's still a lot of time to figure out everything. Is Patrick Corbin really this? Or is he eventually going to become a better pitcher? What is the lineup? Juan Soto coming back. That's big. This team doesn't have its true identity yet or any sort of flow to them at this moment. You lose emotional games against the New York Yankees in a previous series. You're talking about walk-off losses. So that plays a role in to that play and you would think like they'd come with some fire because of that we're upset we're pissed off we lost a chance we could have beaten the Yankees imagine a team like Washington whether the Yankees record is great or not you know what they're supposed to be you know everything about the New York Yankee logo and what their expectations are if you are facing the Yankees and you end up beating them in two straight games there's a big momentum push there's a big ride and here comes the Phillies you just lost two or three on the road a team that's not very good on the road it's a division ride rival there's a different mojo involved compared to maybe feeling down and feeling like there's more pressure involved because now we have to get this win because of losing those games to the Yankees I'm just watching their team on the other side and questioning what can you rely on with them and I love watching Trey Turner I love watching Juan Soto I think they have some really good significant players they still have Max Scherzer, who just dialed up double-digit Ks the other day and lost, but he did his job. He, he executed the way he needed to. Who are the Nationals? It's, it's a fascinating question. All right, here's some text messages from the Anytime Hotline as well. This is from Corey in King of Prussia. How about Oduble? Finally, someone taking control out there in center field. Yeah, no doubt. Oduble Herrera has been a, a very... Solid player as of late. He's been a, a huge help in this lineup. And if you look at it's funny because he started out so slow. So I'm, I'm just looking at his numbers right now specifically after this game as I'm scrolling through. Man, the Dodgers are losing again as I'm looking for the box score. The Yankees finally beat the Rays. It seems like they can't beat the Rays in Tampa all right, if we go to the box score and we take a peek at our guy, Odubel Herrera, he's now hitting 209. He had two walks and two hits on the day, as I alluded to earlier, with his four times on base. Uh, he, he started out hitting like Roman Quinn style in numbers 085, 090. He's up to 209. And if you go, let's go to his game log, shall we? Let's go to the Odubel Herrera game log. And kind of take a gander at what he's done in like these recent games. I need to look at this monitor to my left because it's a little bit closer to me. 
Game logs, 2021. And game, okay. He has, okay, they don't have the actual game up right now. But he had no games and no hits in the 6-1 to one loss to the Atlanta Braves. He had one hit in the 8-7 to seven loss and one walk. He had two hits and one, no, yes, two hits and one walk in the game against the Braves in game one in the 12 to two victory. His OBP is starting to climb as well as he's working some at bats. There's been a stretch of one, two, three, four, five, six, five of six games. He at least had one hit. So the Odubel Herrera success rate is definitely picking up. And uh, there's going to be times where it's ugly again. There's going to be times where it's not good. There's going to be times where he goes through a funk. That's Odubel Herrera. Expect that. But it is your best option. You know, I'm already hearing maybe we should go out and try and get Chris Bryan, who might not be the best out in center field. But if you play some center field, because that's what he's doing now with Chicago, maybe that's a spot. I don't know what Dave Dombrowski is going to do. I think eventually, as he starts to learn more about what Odubel is and he starts to learn about what he needs to grab at the trade deadline, those type of conversations will come up. But I think right now they're just trying to keep above water, keep their head above water until it becomes more of a demand. Uh, Duran in Philly. Knapp has actually provided positivity over the last two seasons. The reaction was reasonable in the past, but now we can acknowledge that he has stepped in and become a big part of this team's play at times. You're right, Duran. It's it's kind of great. I was an Andrew Knapp hater. There's no doubt about it. But uh, he has been pretty damn solid. And he has solidified a nice role as a backup catcher, locker room guy, clubhouse guy. The presence of him, the fellas love him, calls a good game. And now he's producing at the plate as well. I got to really tip my cap to Andrew Knapp for for solidifying this nice role for himself. And and he's like an actual spark. There's not just a, a, there's not just production at the plate, but there's this energy provided from him. And that's natural with role guys. If Brad Miller has a good day, there's energy. If Nick Maton, because he's young, there's energy. Uh, there's always these lesser talented guys that step in, have a big day, have a big stretch, have a big window, and it creates spark because of they're not naturally the Bryce Harper, the JT, the you know the bigger named guy. So it naturally creates this fire for the team. And Andrew Knapp does do a good job at doing that. And it's it's been consistent over the 60 game season last year. And to start this season, even though the batting average won't say it, the timely hits from Andrew Knapp, it's still there. Last year's still rubbing off, even though the batting average specifically isn't saying it. I mentioned Odubo Herrera and his OBP climbing up a bit as he's like walking a bit more and just getting on base. The Reese Hoskins thing, and I'm going to expand on this more with Reese Hoskins, that's for sure. The amount of walks that he had last year that we hated, it was valid for us to not be happy with that. Now, it's the it's the complete opposite. It's the complete opposite out of Reese, where his OBP is a, atrocious. He's not walking at all. He's striking out too much. You got to find that mix. You went from walking too much and not getting enough power to striking out too much, having decent numbers, going through an ugly stretch, and not walking at all. Uh, you you got to find that balance, Reese. And I'm not saying it's easy, but now you're starting to look lost. But the swing is the same, and uh, I don't know. I'm 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 really torn with my emotional mental battle of figuring out Reese Hoskins. I'll be honest, because it's like extremes all over the place. So, with that being said, thank you all so much for listening. Game tomorrow. Can't wait. I will see you next time.